Imagine there's a computer, and it's trying to send a message to another computer. Along the way, something messes up some of the letters in the message. An electron from outer space, or most likely just another message. Now the second computer receives gibberish and promptly explodes. Now think of a DVD getting a scratch in it, or a QR code getting covered up. Both of these still work. And all of these are actually the exact same problem. And since we aren't seeing computers exploding everywhere, clearly someone smart has come up with a solution. So how does this actually happen? Well, the naive solution is to just send the same message three times. That way, any one letter that gets switched can be repaired. But that's inefficient and wasteful. Instead, we can use Read Solomon Codes, which is a system that allows us to add two extra characters to a message to fix one error. The first thing we'll do is convert our message into numbers, based on the ASCII standard. We'll convert this list of numbers into a polynomial, with the coefficients being the numbers. Next, we'll define another polynomial called the generator polynomial. This polynomial is the same degree as the number of redundant extra characters we're going to add. Let's choose 4, so we can fix at most two errors. We also need to know the roots of this polynomial. I'll just arbitrarily choose powers of 2, so 1, 2, 4, and 8. This will be the same for every message sent from this computer, so we can also use this for the decoding computer when we get to it. Back to encoding, here's the basic idea of the algorithm. We need to find a way to add four terms to the first polynomial so that the result has the same roots as the generator polynomial while keeping the original terms of the polynomial untouched. Well, we know we're going to add four terms, so first let's multiply this polynomial by x to the 4, and now we want the same roots as the generator polynomial. So we want whatever polynomial we come up with to have the generator polynomial as a factor. In other words, the resultant polynomial should be divisible by the generator polynomial. Let's look at this problem with actual numbers that we're more used to. Let's take a random number, 17 for example. What two digits do we have to add to this number in order to make it divisible by, let's say, 7? We'll first add space for those digits, like we did with the polynomial. And in order to make it divisible by 7, we can find what's left when we try to fit as many 7s into 1700. That's just a remainder that you get when you divide the two numbers. If you subtract that from 1700, it's divisible by 7. Unfortunately, you can't have negative digits in numbers, so it's not a perfect analogy, but going back to our polynomials, we can have negative coefficients. And it turns out, this process is the exact same for polynomials. Actually, this makes sense if you think about it. An integer is basically just a polynomial, except x is 10. We can do a polynomial division, then subtract the remainder, which will never be longer than four terms, from the first polynomial. Now the result has the roots of the generator polynomial, as well as having the coefficients of the message polynomial at the start. And that's what we're going to send over to the other computer. Along the way, it'll get corrupted a bit. Maybe a scratch on the CD, or some interference, or even the SSD for getting parts of the message. And if you want to stop forgetting things you've learned, you should try the sponsor for this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform that gamifies the learning experience and keeps you engaged and interested. Brilliant helps you get smarter every day with thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. What makes Brilliant special is that it doesn't just tell you things, it shows you them, interactively. Every lesson, you'll be able to see concepts firsthand visually. It really helps you fully understand the topic rather than just memorizing the surface of it. It breaks down big topics into smaller lessons so you understand every step. For example, if you want to learn how generative AI works, Brilliant's course breaks it down starting from the fundamentals to building an LLM in Python, and everything in between. There are more features outside the lessons as well that help motivate you to learn more. Earn XP in lessons, tricking your brain into having fun while learning something along the way. Streaks help keep you motivated every day, building a habit of learning, even if it's just for a few minutes a day. So if you want to get into the habit of building your skills and knowledge up day by day, use the link in the description to get a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription. Okay, after that sponsored message, I can't quite remember what the message was anymore. I think it was something like this. I'll call this the received polynomial, and we can do a quick and simple check to see if it's correct right away. Since we know the message we sent has roots at 1, 2, 4, and 8, again this is the same for all messages between these two computers, we can evaluate the received polynomial at these points. If they're 0, our message is fine. They're not 0. Our message is not fine. Let's fix it. 
I'm going to be using the original message to illustrate some things, but we'll do everything assuming we don't know the original message. We can think of this problem as finding another polynomial. I'll call it the error polynomial that you subtract from the received polynomial to get the original sent polynomial. The error polynomial looks something like this. Many coefficients are zero, since these correspond to uncorrupted terms. The other ones, though, have some coefficients that I'll label y. We don't actually know which terms these are, though, so I'll call the erroneous terms e. Okay, well, the only points on the sent polynomial that we actually know are at the x-coordinates 1, 2, 4, and 8, with the y-coordinate of 0. So let's start there. Our error polynomial should evaluate to whatever the received polynomial evaluates to at these points. Then when we subtract the error polynomial from the received polynomial, it becomes 0 at these points. So we can get a bunch of equations that look like this. And I'll replace instances of 2 to the power of something with x, with the subscript representing which error it refers to, and the exponent representing, well, the exponent. And this is just a nice little notation thing that you'll find everywhere else as well. All right, so to solve all these equations, I'm going to do something a bit weird. I'm going to take these and put them into a polynomial, so it looks like this. I'll call this a syndrome polynomial. We'll expand, and now we can factor out a big X from these terms, a big X squared from these, and so on. Now, you might notice that these are just geometric series. What that means is that we can split these up, and then take a copy of this equation, multiply it by small x times big X, then subtract the two equations. The left side turns into this, and on the right, all these terms cancel out, and we're left with just these two. With some factoring, we can get this, and then isolate. Do the exact same thing to the other part we split off, and we get this. Now I'm going to put that to the side for a moment and introduce another polynomial. This one is called the error locator polynomial, and it's called that because, by definition, its roots are the inverse of big X, which will help us find which terms are erroneous. So it looks like this. Now let's multiply the error locator polynomial with the syndrome polynomial. These cancel out, and we're left with this. Now there's one more thing we can do. In the future, we'll be able to find the values of big X, so we want to be able to sub in the inverses of those values, and be able to solve for the Y values. The only issue is these parts here. Well, we can remove them by taking this entire expression modulo X to the 4, and this is known as the error magnitude polynomial. Okay, let's try finding some of these polynomials with our example. The syndrome polynomial just uses the syndromes we calculated earlier. Now let's take this equation. We can rewrite it like this, where we subtract x to the 4 times some polynomial from this product. We don't actually care what f of x is, though. Now, this might initially seem impossible to solve. All we know is a syndrome polynomial, and there just seems to be too many unknowns. But actually, if we take the definition of the error locator polynomial and expand it, we can find that the constant term is just 1. So if we multiply both sides of this equation by some number, then we can find any solution that works here, then divide by that number, which will just be the constant term of the error locator polynomial. Well, how do we actually solve this? Once again, let's try to use integers instead of polynomials. Here, we know the values of a and d. Let's just arbitrarily choose 24 and 42. Now, let's change it back to this form and divide by the greatest common factor of 24 and 42, then convert it back to this form. What's important to realize is that these two numbers don't share any factors, which means if you keep going through multiples of this number, the result will cycle through every number from 0 to this number. Because of this, there is always some value for b here that will result in this being 1. In this case, it's 2, and we can pretty easily find c to be 6. Now, 6 was the greatest common factor, which shows that c here is just the greatest common factor of a and d. Okay, well, how do we actually find these two numbers, though? You may know about Euclid's algorithm for finding the greatest common factor between two numbers. Well, it turns out you can extend this algorithm to give us a value for b. Here's how it works. Begin by dividing the large number by the smaller one. We get a quotient q and a remainder r. We'll also keep track of a variable b. For now, it's set to 0 minus 1 times our quotient, so it's just negative 1. Next, we'll do the same thing again, but this time divide the previous divisor by the previous remainder. For the next b value, we'll do 1 minus the quotient times the previous b value, which ends up being 2.
Keep doing this process, taking the divisor of the previous iteration and dividing it by the previous remainder. And for the b value, take the b value from two iterations ago and subtract the previous b value times the quotient from it. Keep doing that until there's a remainder of zero. In this case, we've already reached that. The greatest common factor then will be the remainder of the second last iteration. And the value for b will be the second last b value we calculated. So we find that 24 times 2 mod 42 equals 6. Again, this process is the exact same for polynomials. The only difference is that we stop when the remainder has a lower degree than the maximum number of errors we can handle, instead of when the remainder is 0. We can do this process with the equation we've come up with. Divide x to the power of 4 by the syndrome polynomial. We get some unwieldy fractions, but that's okay for now. Record the remainder and calculate the b-value. Our remainder has a degree of 2, which isn't less than a maximum of 2 errors that we can handle, so we'll keep going. Divide the previous divisor by the previous remainder, record the remainder again, as well as the new b-value. Now our remainder has a degree of 1, which is less than the maximum of 2 errors we can handle, so we stop here. Another small difference with this algorithm for polynomials is that we'll use a final remainder and b-value, which are our values for the error magnitude and the error locator polynomials times n. And remember, we know the error locator polynomial has a constant term of 1, so that's exactly what n is. If we divide by n, all the fractions satisfyingly go away, and we found both of these polynomials. Great, we're pretty close to done, but we still have to find our big X and big Y values to find the error polynomial and the original message. The inverses of the big X values are just the roots of the error locator polynomial. Now, for the quadratic we found here, we could solve for the roots using the quadratic equation or something else, but in most applications, this polynomial is many degrees larger, so let's not use that. Instead, we're going to brute force search it. But it's actually not as bad as it sounds. We know that big X is really 2 to the power of which term the error is at, and errors can only happen in our message. In other words, the highest possible term an error can be located at is the highest term in our message, so we only have to search within that. Doing that, we find that the errors are at the terms with a power of 5 and 7. Note that at this step, if more zeros than the maximum number of errors we can handle is found, that message is corrupted beyond repair, and we would just have to display that. And now for the big Y values. We'll bring back the definition for our error magnitude polynomial with the variables. To find big Y1, for example, we can evaluate this polynomial at inverse big X1. This cancels out everything except this. We'll then divide by x1 and then by this. We can actually be a bit more efficient than this. For larger inputs, this part is actually repeated for every other error. If we take our error locator polynomial and take the derivative of it, it ends up being this. And if we evaluate this at inverse big x1, it becomes this, which matches this part of our error magnitude polynomial. Now we can isolate for big Y1 through a bit of algebra, and we get this expression for the magnitude of an error. And now we finally have everything we need to form our error polynomial and to find our original message. This is what our received polynomial turns into, and hey, that's our original message. And so now we've done our goal, but something still feels a bit off. Those fractions during the Euclidean algorithm, and those huge numbers which will get even bigger with larger inputs. Computers are horrible at working with anything that's not an integer, and can only work with numbers so big, which is why in most practical implementations of Reed-Solomon codes, normal numbers are not used. Instead, a different number system is used, known as a Galois field. For this one specifically, all numbers are whole numbers in between 0 and 255, which nicely corresponds to a byte on a computer. What we need to do then is redefine these five operations so that they still retain important characteristics, but also output only whole numbers between 0 and 255. Let's start by redefining addition. Addition has to satisfy commutativity, which means that if you flip the two things that you add, the result is the same. Associativity, which means that if you add stuff in different order, the result is the same. And the identity element which means that adding 0 to a number doesn't change it. 
There's a nice and very fast operation that does this already and guarantees that the result is within 0 and 255. It's the bitwise XOR operator. Go bit by bit, and if they're the same, the result is 0, and if they're different, the result is 1. The result stays the same, even if you flip the two numbers you're adding, add in a different order, or add 0 to it. Next, we'll do subtraction. The only requirement here is adding something, then subtracting the same thing does not change the original expression. We defined addition as the XOR operator, and it turns out the XOR operator also fulfills this subtraction requirement. Since we defined addition and subtraction as the same thing, the two operations are actually completely interchangeable. This means, at least for this number system, negatives don't matter. Multiplication is a bit harder. It has the same properties we need to keep as addition, except that the identity element is different. It's 1. To do multiplication, I'm actually going to do exponentiation first, at least with powers of 2. The first few act as normal, but once we get to 2 to the power of 8, we run into a problem. We can't go over 255 here. The nice thing here, though, is that a number this big doesn't really have a meaning in our number system. That means we can define it to be whatever we want. Now, we also want every possible number, from 0 to 255, to appear as a result of a power of 2. So let's set this big undefined number to a prime number. I'll choose 29. So now when we get to our problem, add 29 instead, then continue as normal. Note that this is the addition we've just defined, so it's XOR. So now for multiplication, we'll simply look up which power of 2 each of our numbers corresponds to, then use some power laws to combine them into a single power of 2, and then find the product. Note that this time, the addition isn't the one we've defined due to how powers work, so we have to mod by 256. The only caveat here is that we can't define 0 as a power of 2, so we'll just have to manually handle any zeros. Division is the exact same thing, just with a different power law, and actually, so is exponentiation. Okay, so now with a number system that computers like a bit better, let's go through the whole algorithm again, noting the changes. Creating the polynomial from our message is exactly the same, but the generator polynomial is different after expanding it. The division here results in much nicer numbers, and since subtracting is the same as adding, I'll just add the remainder here. Now for decoding. Taking our received message and evaluating it at the generator roots again results in nicer numbers. Going through the Euclidean algorithm is a lot better with no crazy fractions appearing anywhere. Once again, we take these and divide them by n, and these are our error locator and magnitude polynomials. And finding the roots of the error locator polynomial, and thus the locations of the errors, still works the same, except that the numbers are different. The condition of less zeros or an equal amount of zeros compared to the maximum errors we can fix in order to know we can repair this message still holds. Now we take the derivative for the error locator polynomial. Note that these multiplications are not the multiplication we defined, instead they're normal integer multiplications, in other words, repeated addition. And since addition and subtraction are the same, this actually means that all terms with an even coefficient end up being 0, and all terms with an odd coefficient end up with a coefficient of 1. And finally, for each error, finding the magnitude is still the same. So yeah, that's Reed Solomon Codes. If you'd like an interactive example of it in action, I've made a website that lets you play around with it. The link is in the description. And uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, do that.